Hey guys, how's it going? It is the last week four, part four of our Maximizing Profitability and Scalability series. I hope you've caught the first three parts because there are so many great little bite-sized hacks that you can implement right now for instant savings and increased conversions of your Amazon products and e-commerce store period dot. You're going to love it. So if you missed any of those, you can either visit our YouTube channel. Uh, you can just go to youtube.com forward slash amazing at home. Um, or you can go to our blog if you're a reader and you'd rather kind of read the brief on it. And then you also can watch the video right there. You just go to amazingathome.com forward slash blog to check it out. And you're going to see all of the first series, the first three part series, every time we've answered three important questions about maximizing profitability and scalability. So don't forget to check that out. Okay. On to part four, what are we going to cover this week? So first we're going to have Brent Z from AMZ Pathfinder talk to us about the key strategies for launching and promoting your products and brands on Amazon. And then second, we're going to hear from the queen of Amazon listings, Vanessa Hung, and she's going to talk about common mistakes to avoid when launching your products. And then we are going to hear from Sean and Seth from Post Purchase Pro, and they're going to talk to us about some more creative ways to drive sales and growth. All right, without further ado, let's get to it. Hey there, this is Brent with AMZ Pathfinder, and thank you, Amy, and the Amazing at Home team for giving me the opportunity to put this little presentation together. But I'm going to take 10 minutes of your time to talk about key strategies for launching and promoting products on Amazon. We're gonna break this out into four sections, so let me get right to it. Uh, first thing, why expand your catalog in the first place? Successful launches, what do they look like? What are the attributes? Third, Amazon advertising. And the fourth thing, external traffic. So let's get right down to it. First of all, why bother to expand your catalog anyway? Okay, so. I would say one thing we see with our most successful clients is they have a catalog of related products at a variety of price points and a variety of offers, if you will, that address a different set of needs for a customer persona or related customer personas. So what they're trying to do is sell to a certain group of people or persona. Um, you know, understanding keywords and seeing gaps in the market where demand is not being addressed is really important but intelligently expanding your product catalog is even more important than that. So think like Procter & Gamble or Apple would. Uh, you know, what do they do? They have a bunch of products at different price points for different people um, that are within their persona, right? So um, Apple used to call it the complete solution, basically. Uh, I used to work there. But basically, if you had a computer and then uh, AirPods and an iPhone and an iPad, that was like everything, right? And those things are all addressed to a type of consumer avatar that's like the Apple customer. So basically, this SKU growth paired with a solid process for giving each one of those new SKUs enough um, room to breathe and a, product, a chance to thrive uh, is basically what we're talking about here. That's what a launch means to me. And that's why expanding the catalog and the SKU count is super important. So successful launches. What I usually see with our clients who are doing successful launches is they have thresholds for success. So they have a very clear pass fail on what success means for them. They have a timeline, they have a budget, uh, and this way they're not making in the moment uh, split decisions about things, um, you know, are they pass, are they fail? They have these metrics established beforehand. Now it may be true you have to adjust it sometimes, but generally speaking, you want to set some of these things up ahead of time. Um, what are some of the traits of a successful launch in addition to that pass-fail criteria? Uh, the three I came up with here would be coordination, budget, and traffic. So think of coordination this way. It's this idea of like a force multiplier, which I think comes from the military. Uh, basically, it's multiple launch efforts all going at the same time have a bigger impact than any one of those efforts by themselves done in a serial fashion. So you're coordinating it and doing it simultaneously versus things going one by one by one by one. Now we all know about the Amazon honeymoon period, right? Generally speaking, 
probably depending on the subcategory, it's like 30 to 45 to 60 days, right? There's a, there's a period there where Amazon is giving us a chance with a new product. You wanna maximize your efforts in that time window to make sure that you're gonna have the biggest possible impact. So think of coordinating, and I put a stopwatch here just to give the idea of like time, right? We want all these things to happen at the same time. Uh, an example I might give is Amazon ads plus email plus an offer to your Facebook group plus uh, a social marketing push on TikTok. Like those four or five things all combined um, is gonna demonstrate to Amazon that you're serious. And here's a bunch of relevant traffic coming from all directions. Look at all these sales, look at this velocity. This is gonna have a great impact. So the next thing is budget. This one's kind of simple, but you need enough money to be able to pay for advertising, to pay for external traffic, to pay for promos, to use coupon codes, to really try to make it stick, if you will. Um, the One of the biggest mistakes I think I see is uh, clients of ours that launch and they don't put enough muscle behind the launch initially. That is going to lead to, um, in some cases, disappointment. <laughs> so we want to avoid that, if at all possible. So you need enough budget to stick. And it can be, uh, I've been intimidating sometimes with budget for ads in particular because you're spending and you're not seeing a good ACoS, but what you are doing is teaching Amazon what your product is going to sell for, uh, against what keywords, and basically giving it some sales history and velocity. We'll get to that in a second. And then the last thing, traffic. Basically, more eyeballs, more beta is the idea. We wanna get as much relevant traffic to the page as possible, and that, is a factor of, yet again, budget, coordination, and just how many good people we can get on the page that are actually qualified and looking to purchase, uh, like real purchases. You know, we can't do giveaways anymore. No one's doing review buying, that stuff's all black hat. Don't touch that. This is all about relevant traffic. So next thing here, Amazon advertising. This is the area that we know most about at Pathfinder. So let me dive in. Um, I don't wanna get too in the woods. Um, for the specifics of advertising, but let me keep it at a high level that's still useful. So consistent traffic for tightly relevant keywords. We do not recommend setting up dozens of campaigns for hundreds of keywords and just throwing a big pot of spaghetti at the wall. Um, you really wanna try to, in 2023, be as targeted and do as much research as possible and say, this keyword or these other root terms associated with it, because you can think of like a relevant term as a root, and then there's a stem, that's many other you know, terms branching off of that. We think that this is a relevant bet. So we're gonna put a lot of our money against this consistently. So let's just say realistically, 10 to 15 keywords at a high budget per day, exact match, and go from there, right? We're trying to teach Amazon what our product is relevant for and trying to get people that are searching for that to our page and entice them to make a purchase. Maybe we don't have enough reviews yet. Maybe we have a coupon code to help people uh, make the purchasing decision because it's, uh, you know, still doesn't have enough social proof in the form of reviews, but that's the idea. Um, the next thing is to appear on or near similar offers. There's a bunch of ways to do this. You can target ASINs, you can use sponsored display, um, you can do, you know, product targeting. Uh, there's all kinds of ways to appear uh, either on the product detail page or near competitor listings that have the same offer as you. And so you wanna go head to head with them, especially those that maybe you think have a worse offer than you, like the product's not as good, it's a much higher price, the reviews are crap, whatever it might be. Uh, get in front of those because you are testing the response of shoppers that are the same kind of people you wanna to appear to. So make sure to show up on those. Uh, the third thing here, use data to improve the listing. So Amazon PPC data is I would say like a rich source of um, knowledge and is only getting better with more and more reports that Amazon puts out. You're gonna have a lot of things in your search term report, um, your targeting report, and now we even get stats on things like videos, like how long someone's watched a video, what kind of response there is to that. All of that information can be used and cycled back into the product listing itself. So if you notice, hey, we're getting a lot of sales for this keyword, maybe we should make sure to include it more in the bullet points or even in the title, I mean, it's a big change to change the title, but if you have enough data to support, that might be the move to do it. Um, so make sure to uh, have like a virtuous circle there going with, with the data. And last thing, maybe the most important thing is focus on sales velocity, not ACoS. Doesn't matter what your ACoS is. As long as you're not losing thousands of dollars a day, um, it's okay. You need to set aside, allocate a portion of your budget and understand that this is for advertising on the Amazon platform directly. And the idea here is to drive sales velocity, um, consistency, 
and spend. You know, it's not to get a good ACoS. Profitability is a goal for us later down the line. And it may take some months for this to work, right? We talked about the honeymoon period, but even longer than that is the period when uh, products don't have as many reviews as they could and their conversion rate through advertising may be depressed. So understand that a keyword that does not convert really well right now in the first couple of weeks may convert very well six weeks, eight weeks, six months in, uh, and so your stats may look very different. Don't go and write off any keywords unless you're totally sure that they're just irrelevant junk, <laughs> basically. Okay, and the last thing I'll touch on here, external traffic. Let me make it quick. Uh, there's really four things. Paid, which includes Google Ads, but you know that's the first one I think of, but could also be, of course, Facebook, um, Pinterest. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to pay for traffic on the internet. Even Snapchat has a thing, Twitter even. Uh, social, and this is like, Organic social, so TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, community. And by community, I mean, do you have a Facebook group for your products, for your brand? Do you have a Discord community? Any of these things you can use and leverage. And then the last one, email. And this is no joke. I'm not kidding about email. The reality is thousands of D2C brands and well-known household names still rely on email to drive huge numbers of traffic and sales for their products online. Don't ignore email just because it's not shiny and new like TikTok. The reality is it still kicks ass, so go ahead and use it. We use it a lot for our own business, so I know it works on the agency side as well. Okay, and the last thing I'll mention about paid, uh, Google Ads is the thing that's working the best for us right now when it comes to launches. We use a tool called Amped. Um, it has great attribution, and so I do recommend that everyone give that a try. That's like our secondary uh, paid channel besides just Amazon internal. Okay, well, thanks for watching. And uh, yeah, if you got any questions, you can find me at uh, brent.bike. That's just my personal URL that redirects to our website for Pathfinder and everything else. And thanks a lot. All the best out there with your launches. Hey guys, my name is Vanessa Hum, founder and CEO of Online Seller Solutions, and also a community ambassador for Carbon6. And today I'm very excited to be talking to you about what are the common mistakes that sellers need to avoid when launching a product or a brand on Amazon. So the first thing that I, I want to divide it in two different types of mistakes, the ones that are internal to the process on Amazon when, it, when you already have everything set up, and then the external ones, which is everything that happens outside of the platform. So we're going to start with the latter. The first thing that I see sellers doing that are, when launching a product is that they're rushing into the process. So they try to do the research as soon as they can. They try to find the product as soon as, as, as fast as they can, getting samples super quick, not really testing or finding the, all of the solutions they need. So when they don't validate, First of all, of all, the concept of the brand. They don't validate the metrics, so they only see what one single tool is telling them that this niche is or that this keyword has for volume. And they don't understand the trend in the market. It's very likely that they will fail launching this product. Also, the other thing is thinking about the brand as a whole experience. So, for example, some sellers will say, like, oh, I wanna. I want to create a, a product that is around fishing because I'm super big into fishing. But I don't think, for example, when they put the name or when they create a product, what are all of the other different product lines that they could create after? So, for example, they named the brand like Fishing Pole. Right. And that brand is very, very small, like the scope of the pros that you could have under fishing pole are very limited, right? So they don't sit down and think the whole ideation process of like, okay, this is the pro that I want. This is the brand. This is the experience. And I need to understand very well the, the trends. One other thing that happens is if you are looking into a software that tells you that specific niche has an amazing volume or amazing, you know, demand, then you need to really understand if this is a trend or if this is something that will stay uh, for a long period of time. Because if it's something that is just a trend of, of the two last months or something like that, maybe at the time that you launch and have your product available on Amazon, 
that uh, probably died off, right? And the results are not the same. So be very careful of that. Then not doing enough market research. It's obviously one of the biggest ones, especially with trends, with competition, understanding what are the keywords that people use to buy that product on Amazon. Right. Or if you don't have or if you have a unique product, understand what's the angle. How are you going to do it? How are you going to launch? It? It's not the same launching on Amazon where people are looking in the search bar with a very high buying intent than something on Google or on TikTok or, or on Instagram. It's very different. So you really need to understand that. Then one thing is not filing for a trademark. And I think this is huge because. When, when people think about launching on Amazon, they say like, okay, I'm going to launch my product first. And if it's successful, I'm going to uh, file for my trademark, which is the, the opposite way that you should be doing it. Because not having a trademark on Amazon, not having access to brand registry, will really limit your options on the platform. What, what are the things that you could do on the listing? For example, you cannot have a plus content. You cannot have a video um, in your in your main images. You cannot advertise to sponsor brands. You cannot advertise for video. You don't have the uh, programs like Amazon Post, or you don't have brand registry to get access to um, programs that will subsidize your your traffic. For example, uh, attribution, right? So. If you launch a product and you don't have a trademark and after, I don't know, four months of selling, you're like, no, this product doesn't work. Is it a product? Is it the idea? Or is it that you don't have the right tools to succeed on the platform, right? So huge mistake, not filing for a trademark, not getting the, the um, brand registry access as soon as you can. So that's a huge thing. Then going to the internal mistakes that you do when you rush into the process and when you're launching, the first thing is obviously creating the listings with um, little information just to get a barcode, right? Just to get an FNSQ that you can send to your manufacturer. That's a mistake because if you create the listing, then you, you will potentially lose the uh, honeymoon period if you wait too long to to really launch or have the units available. The other thing, and this is probably prior to that step of creating the ASIN, is having GS1 UPC codes. That's a decision that you need to make as a brand or as a seller very early on. Will I get GS1 UPCs or will you go into the route of not having and request an exception, exemption on Amazon? Both are possible and both are very different. The results are very different because not having a UPC will prevent you from expanding to other marketplaces. So if you plan to go to Walmart or Target or any other marketplace, they will ask you for UPCs. And when that's not tied to your Amazon account, then you could face some issues in the future. So also, or, or, or even worse, that's a huge mistake, trying to buy resold or you know, recycle UPCs out of a third-party uh, website. You need to buy the UPC codes in GS1, the official GS1 website. So understanding this will go uh, like take you to different routes. Obviously, if you have UPCs, like original GS1 UPCs, that's amazing. You will, you will, you're set up for success. If you request an exemption and then you want to expand into different marketplaces or channels in the future, you could have encountered some issues. At the end of the day, you need to um, have a plan for that, right? And another thing when creating the listing on Amazon is not writing or spelling the brand name as you have it in your trademark in the USPTO uh, filing registration, right? So some people, for example, my brand is ABC, upper cases, but then when I created the listing on Amazon, I put everything lower cases. For Amazon, or actually for the USPTO, that's a completely different brand. So you need to stick to the brand name that you have in your trademark and be very careful that when you file you, when you file for the trademark you do your research hire a good lawyer to do the research to tell you 
if you have good chances of getting that, because if you get rejected for a trademark, then you could lose brand registry access. And when the listings are already created with a specific brand name, then you could encounter problems getting that change to a different trademark because you got uh, suspended with the first. Then when, when you create the listings, and as I told you, some people rush into a process of create a listing just with a placeholder title, placeholder information, just to get the barcode for, for FBA. If you're going to do that, make sure that you set the launch date for the future. Okay, so you don't miss that honeymoon period and you you close those listings while you don't have inventory uh, on Amazon. So super, super important. I think this is the core of all the mistakes. Every other mistake that people do uh, when launching on Amazon is basically because they rush the process. So take your time. This is not a competition. I think the most important part when launching on Amazon is thinking about the customer experience, the brand experience that you want to give, and focusing really, really well in solving an issue for customers rather than following trends and keywords, you know, volume search and, you know, going for the demand. Because right now, Amazon prioritizes a lot that experience. They're giving brands amazing programs so they can succeed on Amazon, even when you know they have pros that are not such uh, high volume or things like that. So I hope this helps, guys. And make sure if you have any questions, feel free to reach out or leave the questions in the comments. Thank you. I want to say thank you for Amy Weiss and Amazing at Home for allowing Seth and I to share our ideas when it comes to maximizing profits and scalability. My name is Sean Hart. I'm one of the co-founders. That's Seth Stevens, also co-founded Post Purchase Pro. And today we want to answer the question, what are some creative ways to drive sales and growth for your brand on Amazon? Well, Seth, I want to go back to the early days when we first started selling on Amazon. What we did differently was we treated our Amazon business the same as we did our off Amazon business. And when it comes to e-commerce, there are a lot of similarities between an e-com store and a store on Main Street, also known as bricks and mortar. But where a lot of sellers are getting things wrong, Seth, is that if you had a retail store down on Main Street, you would never expect to do business with each customer just one time. You would try to get that customer to come back again and again for repeat purchases. And that's no magic, it's just business. And what we've done right out of the gate was we treated our Amazon business the exact same. So my question to you is, Seth, why would you treat an Amazon customer any differently than you would a customer who just walked into your store? Well, you definitely shouldn't, Sean, but I think the big conundrum here is that most of us that are in the Amazon game, right, so-called, we are first-time entrepreneurs, a lot of us. And we didn't come from Main Street like you and I did. You and I came from direct response and driving our own traffic and understanding the value of a real customer list. But when you step into the Amazon world, if you're a first-time entrepreneur, you have no experience to lean on. So you're just following the rules and following what the courses tell you. But what you don't realize is that the most valuable asset that you have in your business and in any other business, mind you, is your customer list. Amazon just makes it a little bit harder to see that. And that's what we're talking about right now, Sean. Well, a lot of Amazon sellers, Seth, are under the misbelief that having a, a contact or having a relationship with your customer from Amazon is somehow against terms of service. And that could not be further from the truth. Well, we found that it's what you do or try to accomplish with your customer list that becomes against terms of service. Amazon wants us sellers to provide amazing, if not world-class customer support. So when you're building a contact list for the purpose of manipulating reviews or maybe manipulating Amazon's ranking uh, algorithm, then that's definitely against terms of service. But if you're collecting a customer list of your buyers from Amazon, for the purpose of enhancing that customer's product experience or providing world-class customer support, then Amazon loves what you're doing. So the easiest way that we found to create a real customer contact list is to provide extra special treatment and enhance the product or the end user's experience with your product at the point of unpackaging. 
we've all heard of the term product insert, right? It's a product or it's an insert rather, a marketing device that rides along inside your Amazon product. So if you create a scenario, Seth, where your Amazon buyer at the point of unpacking the product makes the conscious decision and the effort to engage your brand. For example, we may make an offer that says, hey, before using this product, go watch this important safety uh, video that shows you how to avoid the seven common mistakes that most customers make with this product, get the best use of the product, the best experience, the best results, don't void your warranty, don't avoid uh, bodily injury, something like that. That's just providing good customer support. All we really need to do is make it about them and then give them an easy way to get access to that value, aka opt in with an email and or phone number, Seth. Yeah, Sean, and I'll give you an example of this, like, or actually a couple. So if you've ever bought a pair of Nike shoes on Amazon, inside the box, there's a little card and it says, download the Nike free run app. You know, it enhances my experience with my running shoes. Another example is, Sean, I bought a trampoline off of Amazon. I could not get the thing together with the paper instructions. And then I saw, hey, they have an interactive app that supports me putting this thing together, right? So as soon as I got the app, my life was so much better. But now <laughs> they have my contact information. And guess what? They reached out to me through email. So they're following up with me. And guess what? I also bought for my trampoline a basketball goal to go along with it. So this is perfectly in line with what we're talking about today. They provided amazing customer service because they gave me support for my product. And then immediately they reached out and said, I'm glad you're loving it, but would you, would this also make your experience better? So that follow-up, Sean, was really key in engaging me as a customer. So I had to change my camera angle real quick. That's real life, right, Seth? But the trampoline that you're that you're talking about, I actually saw this trampoline because I know you purchased it for your daughter at her birthday party. And far be it for me to, to judge, but I now that you're admitting you actually used a cheat sheet, an app to uh to assemble that thing, I'm actually a little bit jealous because I've assembled a trampoline myself <laughs> without the app. But at the end of the day, the trampoline manufacturer literally made your life easier, enhanced your end user experience by giving you a better product experience. And that allows them the opportunity to then send follow-up marketing. And that's what I'm talking about. Follow-up is key. A lot of Amazon sellers maybe have a Shopify store or you have a warranty registration and you're gaining and, and building a customer list, but you're not following up. Your customer needs to hear from you because if they don't, they will quickly forget about you because their inbox is inundated with other messages from other products who are following up. Now, Seth, we've been able to successfully use our customer contact list from Amazon buyers to drive sales, higher rankings, and more reviews. Care to elaborate? Yeah, definitely. So once you have the customer list, now the real exciting stuff actually can begin, right? So um, we didn't know this in the beginning, but Amazon rewards email marketing traffic like they reward no other traffic in the world. And if you look at Amazon's own documents, they show that email traffic driven from an external source is the highest converting form of traffic that comes to Amazon besides their own traffic that's already there. So email marketing is super, super potent. Now think about this. If we send an email back to Amazon to buy our product, Amazon sees that external traffic and they move us up in the search results, but it gets even better. So every time that we drive a sale on Amazon, we create future organic sales because it increases our keyword ranking. But there's so many more things we can do with our contact list. Every time we do a lightning deal, guess what? Amazon ranks our lightning deal on the deals page based on the traffic that that deal attracts as soon as it goes live. So what do we do? We time an email to hit as soon as our lightning deals goes live, we boost to the top of the deals page and now we get tons and tons of extra sales for our deal. Um, the more things we can do, we can actually force our product to show up on competitors or complimentary product listings in the buy it with section by sending an email out and saying, hey, check out our product. And if you buy it with this other product widget A, then we'll give you a discount. And when they do that, Amazon starts to see this relationship between these two products, forcing our product to show up on their page, and that's free extra traffic. So there's all kinds of things we can do with the contact list where we can basically have Amazon reward us like you cannot do unless you have a customer list. Go ahead, Sean. 
All right. So to put all this into perspective, Seth, what we're talking about is managing or or creating a contact list, managing the contact list, and then monetizing the list. You can't stop with only creating a list. That list have to, has to be managed and it has to be monetized through follow-up marketing. All right. It's three simple steps. You can easily do it on your own. If you'd like to learn more about that, we do this as a service specifically for Amazon sellers. You can go to Post Purchase Pro. You can see it above Seth's head there, postpurchasepro.com, and then reach out. There you go. Book a friendly call if you if you want to find out more information about what we're doing as a service. Or if you have any questions about the content of this video, this is something that you definitely can do. You just have to take the necessary steps, take action, and start being proactive about creating a real relationship. Because at the end of the day, that's what a real brand is. If your customers don't trust you enough to do business again and again, then you're not really creating a valuable brand. You're just making transactions on Amazon. If you'd like to download a copy of the book Seth and I released about a year ago, Private Label Millionaire Secrets, just reach out to us, CS for customer support, CS at postpurchasepro.com, and we'll get one out to you in PDF ASAP. Thank you so much, Amy, and what you're doing over there. We love the work that you're doing at Amazing at Home, and hopefully this does more to answer this question, what are some creative ways to drive sales and growth for your brand on Amazon? I love it. Maximizing profits and scalability. Hope to see you next time. Take care. See you soon. Wow, that was really, really great. I so enjoyed those tips. They were so easy to follow. Great things that we can implement right away. I hope you guys have really enjoyed this series. I know I have. I've learned a lot. And um, let's make the most of these tips. Let us know. Give us some feedback. Tell us what's working for you. Um, tell us what your favorite tips have been. Tell us who you want to hear more from. Maybe we could do a full class with somebody. Uh, but loved it. And uh, we'll have more coming to you next month. So thank you.